everyone. Um, so I'm Sophia, and so welcome to our uh, to the Life of Stars event. So as Manik mentioned before, I'm a third year studying at ANU. I study astronomy and astrophysics, um, and I also work as a research assistant at Mount Stromlo, where I work um, in Lisa Cooley star formation and galaxy evolution group. And so that's sort of my passion, and I love studying stars, star formation, stellar evolution, and so on. And this is a photo of the research group. It's actually grown a lot bigger now um, since, since July last year, but um, yeah, from our running retreats in July last year. Um, so yeah, so today I'm going to be talking a lot about stars. So the little twinkling things that you see in the night sky. Um, and here's a, a little history fact for you, but in, uh, in Cambridge in 1965, there was a colloquium where, um, Fred Hoyle, who was an English astronomer, he actually said, um, he commented that, um, oh, basically a star is like a simple thing. And um, he, Fred Hoyle is actually quite significant, by the way, because he formulated the theory for stellar nucleus uh, synthesis, which I'll talk about a little bit about later. And uh, Rod, Roderick Redman, who was also an English astronomer, he replied to him, you know, yeah, stars would look you know, you'd look pretty simple too from, you know, 10 parsecs away. So although stars are very far away, they're actually quite complex and there's lots of different types of them they come in all different sizes, masses, brightnesses and temperatures and so on. And so stars, what actually, what actually are they? Does anyone know what they are? Yeah? Yeah, exactly. So they're a big giant ball of super hot gas and they're comprised of mainly hydrogen and helium. So the closest star to us is our sun. Does anyone know what the next closest star is? It's Proxima Centauri, yep. So it's about 4.2 light years away. And so our sun in our solar system is the star that the whole, that all of the planets in the solar system orbit. Um, does anyone know how old the sun is? So the sun's pretty, pretty old. Um, it's actually halfway through its lifetime. Um, and so it's, it's middle-aged, but it's not old enough to need a walking stick. So why do we observe stars? Why are they like important? What information do they tell us? And if we want to learn about stars, why don't we just look at our one star, the sun? So stars are really important. They're a really important part of astronomy and astrophysics, stellar astrophysics, because it is around stars and we look at stars, um, to find uh, exoplanets, for example, and planets that might be hosts to life or habitable planets. Um, stars are also really important because when we study them, um, studying their environments and, and the conditions in which they form provide insight into star formation and galaxy evolution as well. Yeah, so I'm just gonna use this photo for a second again. Going, going back to the sun for a second, why, why I mentioned before, why can't we just study the sun, for example, and watch the sun live out its lifetime and die and so on. You know, it's because stars have such a, such a huge, huge lifespan. So I mentioned before that the sun's only halfway through its lifespan, but it's actually, it's 4.5 billion years old. So it's, it's really, really old in our terms, but in, you know, astronomical terms, it's, it's you know, medium age. Um, yeah, so when we, Basically, when we look at a star right now, where we, we can only see a snapshot of that star. We can only see a glimpse of it in, in one small part of its lifetime. And so a good comparison that I like to use is that studying a star or looking at one particular star is like looking at a family photo and trying to work out how those people in that photo lived. So by looking at one star, you can't really tell much. Um, you can learn a lot, but you can't learn everything about it. And so what we want to do is that similar to a photo when you look at hundreds of different kinds of people if you look at hundreds of different kinds of stars then you can learn about you can learn about them in general how they live how they evolve and how they die um, and so if we do this with stars and we study hundreds of different types with different masses and brightnesses and temperatures and environments you can get a better picture and a better understanding of um, the, the life of stars So, does anyone know how many stars are in the observable universe? 
one times 10 to the 24. So we don't even have a name for that number. It's just, it's, it's huge. It's, um, yeah, and so they come in all different shapes and sizes and the most commonly used, uh, the, common, the most common sort of method of classifying them is by their spectral type. So their um, temperature and luminosity. So this little sort of simple diagram here, um, you can see that each spectral type is uh, denoted a letter. And so the biggest and brightest and hottest stars are called like OB stars. And then as you get cooler down, you get to K and M stars, which are the faintest and dimmest. Our sun is actually a G type star. So this is a really important diagram in astronomy. And does anyone know what it's called? So it's a scatter plot, which shows the relationship between stars' luminosities um, and their temperature. And it's called the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, or HR diagram for short. And most of the stars, oh, <laughs> um, <laughs> most of the stars occupy the region in this, the little diagonal part of the diagram, that's called the main sequence. And so on that, um, in this stage of their life, this is when they're fusing hydrogen in the cores. And then on the horizontal branch, so off to the side there, um, those stars are fusing helium and burning hydrogen in a shell surrounding the core. And so something that's really interesting that you might have picked up on is that as you increase the luminosity, so as you go up in the y-axis, you get bigger and bigger stars. And this is because of the mass um, luminosity relation. So as stars increase in mass, they increase in luminosity um, as well and temperature. Um, and this really only holds for main sequence stars as well, I should add. Um, yeah, so there's many different types of stars. So I mentioned before, I showed you before that, that we could classify them by spectral type, but they also have, you can also have, diff there's also different names for them as well, um, which you can uh, have a look at as well. Um, so the smallest stars, uh, which are red and are quite dim, they don't really give off much of a glow. Then there's sort of more medium stars like, um, like the sun and then the larger stars are blue like that blue giant star there and so they are very very bright and very hot as well and the larger the main sequence star the hotter and brighter they are and so firstly you've got dwarves which are these uh, where are they yeah the dwarf stars they're really small and you have uh, red and yellow dwarf stars and then you also have white dwarf stars so a white dwarf is um actually does anyone know what a white dwarf is please so when it collapses um its remnants um you end up with a white dwarf star basically um does anyone know what a brown dwarf is so it's the one right on the end there exactly so it's a failed it's a yeah it's a failed star it never got um it never accreted enough mass it never got large enough for fusion to occur um inside its core so it's a failed star. Um, then we also have giants. So these can be like main sequence ones, or they can be sort of super giants as well. Oh, the last one, I don't think it's on there, but the last one is a neutron star. Does anyone know what a neutron star is? It is very tiny and very dense, and so it's very heavy as well. So some different properties that we can look at and study in stars are its mass and radius, or size, uh, the surface temperature and gravity, the luminosity or brightness, which I talked about before, um, its age, and what I'll probably be talking about for the rest of this talk is um, metallicity. So I study a lot about metallicity of stars and star forming regions. Um, and that's it's, it's my yeah, personal favorite thing, or I guess quantity to study about stars. Um, so I'm a little bit biased, but yeah, I'll be talking about that. And so metallicity, does anyone know what metallicity is? It's, it's a quantity which describes uh, the chemical composition of a star or more specifically the amount of an element 
uh, relative to hydrogen. And so when we talk about an element, we, we basically talk about any element other than hydrogen or helium. And these elements we refer to in, in astronomy, any element other than hydrogen and helium, we refer to as a metal, um, hence the name metallicity. Stars and star forming regions and galaxies can have different amounts of elements relative to hydrogen and helium. So they can be quite rich in metals, they can be metal rich, or they can, be, they can have barely any metals at all and they can be very high in hydrogen and helium only. Um, so we don't really care about elements other than hydrogen and helium because they're the most abundant elements in the universe. So metallicity is a really cool thing to study because by finding out how much metal is in a star or a star forming region or um, even, even a whole galaxy, um, we can find out more about the age of the um, generation of the star that um, the, the type of generation that the star uh, sort of exists in, so what type of population it is, or um, it can provide information about the star formation occurring in that galaxy. And so the process uh, that we refer to when we talk about metallicity is called nucleosynthesis. And so this is the theory uh, that I mentioned before that Fred Hoyle um, came up with. And this theory describes how heavier elements are formed in stars and over time as those stars die, so whether through uh, stellar winds or supernovae, those heavier elements which are formed in the cores of those stars, they're deposited in the surrounding environment called the interstellar medium. So the interstellar medium describes the loose space between stars. And so these heavier metals are deposited in this space around the stars. And so then when the next generation of stars is born, they're born into a more metal rich environment. And so they're born already with heavier elements. And so then they can continue to use even heavier elements and the cycle continues. And so, yeah. And so this means that the next generation of stars is born with a higher metal content and can use even, as I mentioned, heavier elements over their lifetime. And so I guess if, yeah, so it follows that older generations of stars um, generally have lower metallicities uh, than those of younger generations. So newer generations of stars have had lots of generations of stars before them. And so they've had time to, um, you know, fuse heavier elements and then die and then be born to, and, and so on. And so they are formed in a more metal rich universe. I might have mentioned before that um, specifically my research uh, and what, what I like to study is not the stars themselves, but the star, the regions where they're formed. So these regions are these regions of ionized gas, um, these clouds of ionized hydrogen specifically called H2 regions. And so these are where stars are formed. And so you can study not only the metallicity of the stars themselves, but also of these star forming regions. And so this is, this is basically my research that so I study like star forming regions. I study um, the chemical abundances of these regions as well and how that provides insight into the chemical evolution of galaxies essentially. And so, yeah, by studying these clouds of ionized gas, we can find a lot about, we can find out a lot about how stars are formed. So right now I'm studying this really amazing local spiral galaxy, NGC 628, uh, with the survey signals. And in addition to studying metallicity across the H2 regions of this galaxy, I'm also looking at like pressure and density. Um, and they're really important quant quantities too, because um, like metallicity, we can't directly derive it. We have to use methods such as for metallicity, we use um, emission line ratios. And so we can use various, various diagnostics and emission line ratios to derive metallicity. Um, yeah, for pressure and density, on the other hand, normally we assume they're like, um, normally we assume they're constant quantities across um, a H2 region or even across a whole galaxy, but that's not actually the case. And so what I'm trying to do is actually try and, uh, and derive accurate um, uh, quantities for those so we can get a better picture of um, the physical properties of H2 regions. 
yeah and so I guess that brings me to the last thing this is a little picture of my research right now um, these are a few examples of some metallicity maps from my current research and this these show different metallicity diagnostics so in H2 regions the type of metallicity that we look at is called gas phase metallicity um, or also known as oxygen abundance so I mentioned before that uh, for metallicity we can look at um, the abundance of certain metals or certain elements relative to hydrogen. Uh, for gas phase metallicity of H2 regions, we look at the um, abundance of oxygen relative to hydrogen. And so these different diagnostics show interesting results. So like one of them shows a very uniform metallicity. And then on the far right, that's the newest diagnostic that my supervisor just came up with. So she hasn't even published it yet but it shows a really nice gradient where you have like a high metallicity in the middle of the spiral, um, which means that sort of towards the center of the galaxy has a higher proportion of heavier elements relative to hydrogen. And then towards the, uh, throughout the spiral arms and on the edges, you have lower metallicity uh, regions. Um, but yeah, feel free to ask me about my research later. But yeah, I guess that brings us to the end of this talk. I really hope you enjoyed learning about types of stars and studying stars and also metallicity as well. Um,